I previously expressed skepticism that stem cells could treat multiple sclerosis, but today I'm prepared to eat my words and I'll show you the results of a randomized controlled trial of intrathecal mesenchymal stem cells in progressive multiple sclerosis. And remember what Charles Koch said, the only way you improve is to try new things. Now, there are many prior publications on stem cell research in MS. For instance, this is a small phase one trial done by Dr. Saad Sadiq of the Tisch New York MS Center, the same authors of the phase two trial I'm about to show you. This was a small trial, only six people with progressive MS. It was an open label trial. Everyone knows they're getting the treatment and they received anywhere from two to five intrathecal injections. These are injections into the cerebral spine a fluid, they get a spinal tap, but instead of taking out fluid, like if you're trying to diagnose MS, they give the stem cells. These are autologous cells from your own bone marrow, but manipulated in the lab, and they form mesenchymal stem cells, which are the type of stem cells that could potentially form neural tissue, and you may see this acronym MSCNP. These are mesenchymal stem cell neuropogenitors, which could potentially repair nervous tissue. This was a small study, but they had a good follow-up of seven. 7.4 years on average, and they reported it was safe, no major safety concerns. And four out of six, the majority, had some kind of measurable improvement. And in my prior video, I expressed a lot of skepticism of this because, hey, there are a lot of things you can measure, and there's a placebo effect as well. So it's natural you could see some improvements. So you really need a randomized trial. Hence the inspiration for this phase two trial. By the way, this is Dr. Saad Sadiq. I met him once at a professional conference. He was very nice to me. Also, I actually spoke to one of his colleagues because I was giving a patient with progressive MS off-label intrathecal methotrexate, and they were very helpful to me in administering the treatment properly, giving me guidelines, that sort of thing. And I give their team a lot of credit for being so innovative and entrepreneurial and publishing their results to be lauded or criticized. You got to give them a lot of credit whether you agree or or disagree. Anyway, this is a randomized, double-blind, placebo-controlled trial. It's at just one site, of course, the Tisch MS Center. There were 54 participants, 27 getting the treatment versus 27 getting placebo, though a few people did drop out of the study. And the treatment group received six intrathecal injections of the autologous mesenchymal stem cells. And again, these are mesenchymal stem cell neural progenitors, MSC NPs. They got it every two months for one year. And if you were in the placebo group, you just got intrathecal saline. So you didn't know if you were getting the treatment or not. Now the person performing the procedures, which was just one clinician, was not blinded. I think there were some technical difficulties in making that person blinded, but they used a curtain so the patient didn't know if they were getting the treatment or not. And the examining physicians were blinded to the treatment. So it was in fact a double blind study, but it wasn't a one year study, it was a two-year study because after one year, they did a crossover where those getting the stem cells were then switched to saline and those getting the saline were switched to the mesenchymal stem cells. Now, I don't like this design because it gets a little messy. Maybe if someone getting stem cells in year one improves in year two, you could say it was the effect of the prior stem cell treatment. It gets a little messy, but then again, that's how you recruit people into these studies where you have to have numerous spinal taps, you guarantee they're going to get the treatment at some point. The primary outcome of the study was something called EDSS Plus. This is where you improved in one of three categories. EDSS or expanded disability status scale. This is a measure of disability used in multiple sclerosis research or the time 25 foot walk, how fast you can walk 25 feet. You had to improve at least 20% or the nine hole peg test, a measure of hand function in multiple sclerosis research where you have to put little pegs into holes. And again, you had to improve by at least 20% for it to be significant. By the way, my name is Brandon Bieber. I make videos about MS every Wednesday. Of course, I am skeptical of this type of research, though I have no specific conflict of interest. 
and I'll try to be unbiased. The inclusion criteria for the study required you have progressive MS, you have an EDSS of 3 to 6.5. This is basically moderate disability to requiring a walker to walk. You had to be stable, no relapses in the last year, and no major change in the EDSS of 1 or greater. On your MRI scans, you had to have no gadolinium enhancing or active lesions, and no new T2 lesions in the last six months, and a disease duration overall of less than 20 years. I'm not sure of the purpose of this inclusion criteria. It would actually exclude a lot of people with progressive MS. You had to have no recent changes in disease modifying therapy in the last year, and no change in medications used to treat MS symptoms in the last six months, such as Ampira. Of course, this could confound the results. Here are the people in the study. You can see on the left the people who originally got randomized to stem cells, on the right people who got randomized to saline. About 70% were women. You can see the distribution of subtype of MS, secondary progressive MS versus primary progressive MS, and level of disability was about evenly distributed. The median age was a little bit greater in those getting mesenchymal stem cells, 53 versus 49 in the placebo group. Roughly equal median duration of disease, 12 in the stem cell group versus 11 in the saline group. And you can see at the bottom, almost all of these people were getting some type of disease modifying therapy. And most of them, 69%, were getting a B cell depleting drug, a high efficacy drug, either Ocrevus or Rituximab. And so these people shouldn't have had a lot of new MRI lesions or relapses. So we're sort of taking away the inflammatory aspect of the disease and focusing on the regenerative aspect. For whatever reason, more people getting natalizumab or tysabri, six out of the seven taking that drug were randomized to the saline group. In the article, they describe the technicalities of the stem cell treatment. This is admittedly beyond the area of my expertise. They performed a bone marrow aspirate. They cryopreserved the sample and cultured it in neural maintenance media and then extracted the mesenchymal stem cells. Then a dose of 10 million cells was suspended in saline and given via spinal tap or lumbar puncture but two people in the study had an existing baclofen intrathecal pump, so they didn't have to have spinal taps. They could just have it given through the pump. Then afterwards, people were placed in Trendelenburg position. In other words, their head was placed downwards so the stem cells could flow throughout the central nervous system. And now we move to the results, and we'll start with the primary outcome. This is the pre-specified goal of the study, the EDSS+. Plus. You had to improve in the time 25-foot walk, the EDSS, or the nine hole peg test, and frankly, it was not successful. 33% receiving the mesenchymal stem cells improved in EDSS plus versus 37% with saline. In other words, more improved getting the placebo, obviously not a statistically significant difference. Furthermore, there were no statistically significant differences in individually timed 25-foot walk, a test called the six-minute walk test, how far you could walk in six minutes, the nine-hole peg test, a test called the MS functional composite, very sensitive to changes in progressive multiple sclerosis, and a test called the PACESAT, PACED Auditory Serial Edition Test, this is a measure of cognitive function. There were no differences in any of those things. However, they looked at various secondary analyses, so bear with me. The first thing they looked at is subgroups. Maybe the treatment didn't work for everyone, but it worked for certain individuals. So in this chart, you're looking at two outcomes, the time 25-foot walk on the left and the six-minute walk test on the right, how far you could walk in six minutes. And they divided people up into lower and higher higher disability. So at the top, people with lower disability, EDSS of 3 to 5.5, there were no differences. You can see people getting mesenchymal stem cells versus saline were about the same. However, if you looked at people with EDSS 6.0 walking with a cane or 6.5 walking with a walker, there were statistically significant differences. So we'll start on the right side in this box, the six-minute walk test. People getting mesenchymal stem cells were only slightly worse, maybe losing 10% of their distance over two years. There was a greater decline in people getting saline, the placebo, and this was statistically significant, P equals 0.036. If you look at the time 25-foot walk, you can see 
people getting mesenchymal stem cells stayed the same, but there was a big drop in people who were getting saline. Now, when you measure time 25 foot walk, it's typically in seconds, like eight seconds to walk 25 feet. So going down is actually good. They explain in the article that they're measuring walking speed or something else, and they report this as an improvement. I don't know what's going on. Maybe the graph is just mislabeled or something, but they report that this was supposed to be an improvement. And in fact, in this subgroup, EDSS 6 to 6.5, there was a greater than 20% increase in speed, not time, in 54%. Uh, getting saline, excuse me, this was increase in time versus 10% getting the stem cells. So this favors the stem cell group, p-value 0.074, not statistically significant, but close. So maybe there were some improvements in people who had more existing disability. They also looked at bladder function. This is a urodynamic study, a complicated urologic procedure. Not everyone in the study underwent it. It's quite uncomfortable. And they reported an improvement in 76% or 13 out of 7 people receiving the stem cells versus only 27%, 3 out of 11 in those getting saline. They didn't report a p-value. This is just me using an online chi-squared calculator, but it seems to be statistically significant. Another way to look at this is the post-void residual, how much is left in the bladder after you urinate. Many people with multiple sclerosis and other forms of spinal cord injury have detrusor sphincter dyssynergia. In other words, the bladder contracts, but the sphincter muscles don't relax, and there's more urine left in the bladder afterwards. Normally, there's very little after urination, maybe 20 to 30 mils, but in some people with MS, it can be more. People getting saline in the study had worsening of the post-void residual by a little bit, and people getting the stem cells improved, and it was statistically significant, P equals 0.026. What about preventing brain shrinkage, brain atrophy, a marker of progressive multiple sclerosis. Well, if you look at the study in its entirety, there was no benefit. Mesenchymal stem cells didn't prevent brain shrinkage overall. However, the authors suggest if you look at a certain subgroup, maybe there's an effect. So this is the data for people who had the highest amount of gray matter at the beginning of the study, the highest normalized gray matter brain volume relative to their age and gender, the top 50th percentile, 50 to 100th percentile. On the left, you're looking at just total gray matter volume. On the right, you're looking at gray matter as a percentage of intracranial volume, though they're roughly the same thing. People getting saline had slight atrophy of gray matter, whereas people getting mesenchymal stem cells had a very slight gain. And you can see the p-values 0.018 and 0.031. It is slightly statistically significant. However, this is just cherry-picked data because if you look at people in the bottom 50th percentile, these are people who had a lower amount of baseline gray matter volume relative to their age and gender, it was the opposite. Now the saline group is doing better than the stem cell group, and it just makes no sense. How are stem cells going to know how much gray matter volume you have and decide whether they're going to help you or not? It's just random chance. This is just cherry-picked data. I don't believe there's any effect. Now another thing they looked at was biomarkers. One of them was matrix metalloproteinase 9. This is an enzyme involved in degrading the extracellular matrix, and these are the people who originally were randomized to saline. And you can see in people getting saline, there was no difference between the start and the end. But once they switched to mesenchymal stem cells, it shot up and it was a big increase. In fact, all 50 people who got the stem cells, some got it in year one and some got it in year two, had an increase in matrix metalloproteinase 9. So this isn't random chance. This is definitely a real biologic effect. This enzyme is involved in remodeling tissue and repair. It's involved in embryonic development. However, it's not clear that it's a good thing because it's also involved in tissue damage like the formation of vascular aneurysms and can be involved in invading tissues and the metastasis of cancer. So it's hard to say, but it could be beneficial. They also looked at 
get CCL2, chemokine ligand 2. This is a pro-inflammatory cytokine involved in the recruitment of white blood cells. These are the people who were originally randomized to saline. You can see saline made no difference. It stayed the same. But once they got the mesenchymal stem cells, it declined. So interestingly, even this therapy that's supposed to be regenerative may have some anti-inflammatory effects. Very interesting. Finally, we look at the side effects, and there weren't really serious side effects you could clearly attribute to the treatment. A lot of people get headaches when you do a lumbar puncture. It damages the meninges. The cerebral spinal fluid can temporarily leak out, causing a headache, especially if you stand up. This occurred in 34% of people getting the treatment versus 15% getting saline. I'm not sure why there was a difference, because it's really the needle that's causing the side effect, and it usually resolves within a few days. In the treatment group, someone got hyperparathyroidism, elevated parathyroid hormone. They had to have their parathyroid removed. Someone else got urosepsis, in other words, a severe infection due to urinary tract infection requiring hospitalization. Another person had a lung infection. Someone got appendicitis with bowel perforation. But these things were more likely due to the person's overall health or their immunosuppressant they're taking rather than the mesenchymal stem cells. And of course, many people getting saline had side effects such as deep venous thrombosis, long COVID, severe urinary tract infection, cholecystitis, in other words, infection of the gallbladder requiring surgery. So it was probably just random chance. So in reviewing the efficacy results of the trial, I am going to end with my straightforward and honest opinion. I think that's the most ethical thing. And my opinion is that the treatment was completely ineffective. I don't think it did anything in this study. I'm really not impressed by the subgroup analysis. I think that can be very arbitrary. And of course, biomarkers and arbitrary subgroups, who knows what that means. You see a lot of random chance in different subgroups. I think if the treatment works, we would see a difference in the primary outcome, or at least something like six-minute walk test and MS functional composite, which should be very sensitive to even small changes. That being said, it doesn't mean that the treatment definitely doesn't work. This was a relatively small study, only 50 or so patients with short follow-up, only one year randomized treatment versus placebo. The big drug companies studying their disease-modifying therapies, they often have studies 400 versus 400, two-year follow-up, a large phase three trial, and that's probably what you're going to need to do to show small differences in progression progressive MS. After all, a lot of people with progressive MS are pretty stable. There's not a big difference in their symptoms over a one-year period. And if you want to look at a small difference, you need a longer study with a larger sample size. And I would not be opposed to a phase three trial on mesenchymal stem cells. It's just difficult for one center to do. So you got to give a lot of credit to the Tisch MS Center for trying, and sometimes you have to fail to succeed, and there could be technical advances in stem cell treatments allowing this to be more successful in the future. However, just to be very straightforward, I think that if there were a phase three trial, the most likely result would be that it would show no benefit based on the results of this phase two trial, but you never know. I'd be interested to know, do you agree or do you think that I'm underestimating how promising this research is? And if you had the opportunity, would you participate in a phase three multi-center randomized trial where you didn't know if you were going to get the treatment and the placebo and you had to have maybe six or even 10 spinal taps to receive the treatment. And let me know if you have received any kind of stem cell treatment, mesenchymal or otherwise, and what were your results. And let me know if you have ideas for future videos.